I'm Sasha. I'm a Chaplain's Office alum, and I'm here to teach you how to make an Ashkenazi-style challah to be eaten on the Jewish Sabbath, or Shabbos, or Shabbat. This is an Ashkenazi-style challah, which means that it's an eggy, sweet, and rich dough. It's a soft bread, delightful for French toast, day after. Um, and I'm so excited to show you how it's done. So we need to start with our ingredients. You'll need some flour, all-purpose. You can also mix that with the rye flour, or a whole wheat flour for health or flavor. Um, you'll need some yeast. This is some active dry yeast, easily available in most grocery stores, most corner stores as well. You'll need three eggs. Two of them are for the dough, and one of them is for the glaives. So I'll put that one aside. You'll need some salt, a little bit of sugar, totally doesn't matter what kind of sugar, it could be white sugar, brown sugar, fine sugar, whatever. You'll need some unflavored oil, I like to use canola oil. And you'll need some sweet kind of syrup. So this is Ceylon, which is a date syrup or date honey. You can also use regular honey or even molasses if you'd like. So to start out with, we're going to need about a cup and a quarter of lukewarm water. And by lukewarm, I mean something that you can comfortably put your finger in like so. You won't have to take it out, but it does feel warmer than skin temperature. This is so that the yeast will activate nicely. And then we want a tablespoon of yeast. So I'm going to measure that out in three teaspoons. One teaspoon, two teaspoons. 3 teaspoon. Pro tip, super helpful to figure out where on your hand different measurements go because then you don't need to use extra spoons that you then need to clean. And once you have your yeast and your water together, stir that around a little and add your sweet things because yeast, like most humans, loves sugar. So we're going to put in one two tablespoons of sugar, and one tablespoon of Ceylon or honey, and stir those together. You don't have to be super careful about making sure every little bit is incorporated because as soon as it's basically all set together, we're going to leave this to sit so that the yeast can activate. So now that we've let this sit for about 5 or 10 minutes, you can see that the yeast mixture has gotten cloudy and foamy, and that's great because it means that we've proven that the yeast is alive. So now we have to add the rest of our wet ingredients. And then a quarter cup of oil, which is equivalent to four tablespoons. Also pro tip, if you learn the viscosity of different kinds of oils and syrups, you don't have to use measuring spoons. Um, and then we also want a tablespoon, sorry, a teaspoon and a half of salt. break up the yolks and mix the whole thing together. So at this point we're ready to start adding the flour. And we want to do this slowly because otherwise we might add too much flour and then we'll get a very dry dough. So I like to start with two cups. I'm going to put one cup of the all-purpose and then, just for fun, I'm going to mix the other uh, cup in this first stage of rye and whole wheat.
And we want to stir this all together until it becomes a really nice smooth batter. This is your opportunity to mix in any last bits of egg that may not have gotten beaten into the liquid before and to make sure that you don't start out with any enormous lumps. Okay, I think that's smooth enough. So then we can add another cup of flour. You can see that we're already getting closer to something that you might reasonably call a dough rather than a batter. But it's certainly not there yet, so we want to add another cup. Now this one, it's fine if it doesn't all come together with the spoon and bowl, because very soon we're going to switch to kneading. But you do want to see if you can incorporate as much flour as possible because that will make the eventual kneading process a lot easier. So now that you've got something that looks like a very shaggy, sticky dough, it's time to turn it out onto your work surface because it's going to be way harder to use a spoon or a spatula at this point. So take that extra half cup of flour that is in the sort of baseline amount of flour you're going to be using for the recipe and spread it over your work surface. This means that when the dough comes onto it, it won't stick to your counter and also you'll be incorporating the rest of the flour in the recipe. So scrape it out onto the flour. to get every last bit can. And then set the bowl aside because you'll need it later. Okay, so now you wanna flour your hands with some of that flour on the work surface. And put some on the top of the dough because it is very sticky and start folding it over and patting it down. It's like very gentle kneading, but at this point it's not quite robust enough to put all of your elbow grease into it. Sort of gently fold it over, roll it up, fold it over. And now we're looking at something that looks a lot more like dough, but it's you know easily breakable, it's really soft, doesn't have a lot of structure. So now we're going to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes kneading it. So the way that I like to knead is a sort of stretch, roll, and fold situation. So we're going to stretch it out roll it back towards you, pressing down each time. Then we're gonna press that fold down. Stretching out, roll and fold towards you. Stretching out, and roll and fold towards you. Now you'll see it's getting a little bit sticky. This degree of sticky is okay. But if it gets stickier than that, if it starts really sticking to your work surface, which I imagine it's going to do on this next knead, Yep, see like all of that? That's a little much. We don't need to deal with this. That's why we have that extra half cup of flour that's optional in the recipe. So if your dough starts acting like so, you can slowly add some of that onto your work surface. You may not need to add it all, you probably won't. So you wanna be pretty sparing with how much you're using. 
but you also don't want this to happen. And there we go, back to the kneading. So people think about lots of different kinds of things when they're kneading. I find it's a very useful expression of internalized rage uh, because you can really put your elbow grease into it, literally put your whole weight on this. It's very satisfying. You can involve some punching. Other people like to have, you know, softer, more bread and home-like thoughts, which is totally valid. It's just not my jam. And the other thing that I like to think about, aside from, you know, valuable and delicious expressions of anger or other kinds of overwhelm, is how cool all the science is. Because what we're doing right now is we're building up the strands of gluten and making the dough stretchier and stronger. And that means we're going to have basically a web of gluten at the end of this um, that's a pretty robust structure and we'll use that to make sure that when the dough rises it doesn't collapse and it'll have sort of a network of places for the yeast to let off all of their fun little gases and make the bread rise. So it's been a few more minutes of kneading, and we have something that looks a lot more like a ball of dough than before. However, it's not done yet, and we know this because when you poke it, it still stays pretty sunk in. It doesn't spring back like a fully kneaded dough would. The other thing we're on the lookout for is something called the window pane test. So you're going to take a little bit of your dough, spread it out between your fingers carefully, and if it gets thin enough that you can see light through it before it breaks, that's good. You see here how that is open? That means that we haven't quite developed the gluten structure yet. So I'd say this dough is going to need another eh, four minutes of kneading, and then it'll be done. So it's been three and a half minutes, and this is looking a lot nicer. really soft, really stretchy. When you form it into a ball like this and you press it, it springs back instead of breaking. And just for good measure, you can do a window pane test. See? There we go. So that means that it's ready to prove or to rise for the first time. So we're gonna sort of fold it into a nice little ball, like so. And then we don't want it to dry out while it's proving. So we're gonna put a little bit of oil all around the outside. bottom. And we're going to take our mixing bowl put our dough in there cover it with a towel or plastic wrap and leave it to rise in a warm place for eh, I would say an hour and a half two and a half hours depending on temperature of your room, humidity, how your dough is feeling, but basically you want to look for it to double in size. Hi everyone, welcome back. As you can see, our wonderful dough has at least doubled in size. It's all rounded. Here's our friend. Hello. Um, this is the last point in the process at which I like to include anger um, in my practice. So, <laughs> I... This involves punching down the dough, like literally, that's what it's called. And so I recommend that if you have anything to get out, this is a really productive way to do it. Um, also a cool note, in between uh, 
you know, the final kneading. And this is where if you had a larger amount of dough, you would ritually separate a piece if you were following the Jewish practice of taking or separating challah. Unfortunately, this doesn't even reach the point uh, of being sort of enough to take it but not bless it. So I'm not going to do that today. So here we go with the punching down. Nice. Yes. Okay. Very punchy, very fun. Now it's all about building and creativity. So we're going to take our dough, which as you can see, lovely, smooth, strong, but also relaxed. And because this makes two loaves, we're going to cut it in half. I have a nice firm bench scraper to use for this, but you can also just use a knife. Okay, we're gonna take one half, put it back in the bowl, cover it back up so it doesn't dry out. Now, I'm gonna show you how to make a very classic three-strand braid. Now, throughout this part, you probably won't need flour. If you do, use very, very little of it. So first, I'm going to cut this into three pieces, toss them around, see who has a little too much. You know, make sure that everyone gets an equal amount of dough to a side, and we're going to roll. The way we do this is you just press it down. I do actually need a little bit of flour here. So, press it down, and we want to use a rolling motion so that the greatest amount of force is coming from the very heel of your palm. And we're also using a motion like so. We're going outward because we want eventually to have a nice tapered end so that the middle is the part that has the greatest amount of dough. And do put some force into it. You're going to end up with a nice strand of dough that has the tapered ends. So I'm going to rinse and repeat for the other two. So now we have three strands of dough. It's okay if they shrink back a little bit. And here's a trick to help you get a really well-shaped loaf. You're gonna start, instead of starting at the top, you're gonna start here at the middle. So I'm going to put one over the other. Another over that one, and then braid it on down. And when it gets very small like this, just pinch the ends together and tuck that under. And then we're gonna braid it the opposite way. them together, tuck them under. So now you have this nice three-strand loaf um, that has a good shape to it. And we're going to put that on a greased baking sheet.
So for the second dough, I'm not going to show you how to do this one because we do have a limited amount of time, but I'm going to do a fun six strand loaf, um, which is what I tend to do with my challah. So, and there are lots of tutorials out there if you want to learn how to do braids of many different strand numbers and also different shapes. There's lots, for example, for um, round loaves, which are way easier than they look and are also kind of fancy. Once you get to a nice place like this, you can just pinch off the excess. Normally I don't like to waste, but this dough is a little bit looser than my usual, and so I don't want to make things uneven. So I'm going to put this on our rack, and then we're going to glaze it for the first time. To make the egg wash, you take that egg that we left over, and you want a tiny, tiny bit, maybe about a teaspoon of water. Just to thin it out a little. either a pastry brush, but not everyone has one of these, so when I was in college, I always used a piece of wadded up paper towel. So just fold it a couple times, maybe like so, and then you can dip it in your egg wash and just gently glaze your dough. You don't want to use too much because we actually are going to glaze it twice. And I'm going to switch to the pastry brush because I find it easier. Once both are glazed, you just want to set them aside in the same kind of warm place to let them proof for a second time until they've basically doubled in size and are distinctly poppy. So you can see that these are all nice and proved and puffed up. So we're going to do our final egg wash. And this is the point at which you can choose to add any toppings that you'd like. I'm going to leave one of them plain, and then the other one we're going to cover with sesame and sumac. Sumac is a lovely spice, it's a little bit sharp, a little sour, and you can find it online or at any Middle Eastern grocery. And just be generous. Okay, these are going to bake at a 350 degree oven for 25 to 35 minutes. Just keep an eye on them, and when they're golden brown, start checking. All right, and so when they're lovely and golden brown and shiny like this, uh, just take it, flip it over, you'll see a nice dark color, and it's like a door, it's hollow, that means it's done. So with that, let it cool, and while it's still warm, but maybe not quite as boiling as it is now, es gesundheit, which means eat in good health. Good Shabbos, and thank you everyone for watching. Uh, let me know if you make it and if you have any questions.